we were lucky enough to have Rich join us at our second and seventh annual plant stock events, and they were epic. But what's going to be beyond epic is our ninth annual plant stock event, which is going to be streaming live and online around the country and the globe, straight from the Esselstyn family farm after a two-year hiatus, August 14th to the 16th. That's just a week away. With this new format, I couldn't be more excited because everyone gets a front row seat to all the action. We're going to pair the science with the practical application, which means time in the farmhouse kitchen, cooking up a storm with Ann and Jane. We're going to have a world-class video crew that's going to give you a backstage pass to not only the farm, but also the homestead inside and out. You're going to hear from the Brock stars of the plant-based movement, including my father, Dr. Sarai Stanzik, Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Michael Clapper, Brenda Davis, Tracy McWhorter, Marco Borges, and a slew of others. And if you can't watch it live, don't sweat it. Video access is going to be available with every ticket for a year. Partial proceeds will benefit the Esselstyn Foundation, a 501c3 public charity. And if you're having a tough time financially, we get it. Financial assistance is available. Just visit plantstock2020.com to learn more. I want to welcome you to the Plant Strong podcast where each week we celebrate the heroes of the Plant Strong movement. Today is a very special episode because instead of looking forward, I actually take a look back and shine the light on Rich Roll. Rich and I both abandoned our what I'll call steady and stable normal careers around the exact same time back in the 2008-2009 time frame to release books and venture into uncharted career territories that didn't even really exist at the time. We both had young families and let me tell you, it was terrifying. But when you believe in something so much and when you're being pulled so strongly in a direction that resonates with your whole being, you have to act. And fortunately, both Rich and I did. I recorded this interview at Rich's house when I was out in LA last fall. So while you won't hear any dialogue around the current issues that we're facing today, you will hear thoughtful conversation on fear, vulnerability, suffering, epiphanies in life, learning to give and receive love, meditation, and the bravery it takes to shed our old skin and start anew. It's transformative. So even though we look back this week, as you're listening to both of us reminisce, ask yourself, are there changes in my own life that I want to make? Is there a cause I believe in so much that I'm willing to give up virtually everything? What are my own fears that might be preventing me from going after these goals? How can I get out of my own comfort zone? I hope that you, like Rich and myself, recognize and act on those unique moments in your life, those epiphanies that can ultimately alter the course of your life for the better. Perhaps, maybe even this conversation will lead to an epiphany. We certainly hope so. So, enjoy my talk with Mr. Peace and Plants, Rich Roll. So, Rich. Rip. <laughs> Thank you for having me out to your place. It's, uh, I've never been out here before, and uh, it's quite dreamy to say the least. Well, I appreciate you making the trip all the way out here. We, we don't exactly live close to town. I don't know where you're staying, but I guarantee you it was a, it was a hike to get out here. So thank Actually, you. believe it or not, it was only a 30-minute drive. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah That's was, great. Man. Yeah. First 
I want to just say how insanely proud I am of, of you. And, um, you know, when we first met, it was 2009 at that crazy little uh, vegan world right. fest. Um, and you, um, you, I think you had just been named one of the, the fittest you know, men on the planet. Um, I had just written the Engine 2 Diet book. Uh, and to see just how far that you've come since that kind of moment in time is, uh, it's kind of mind boggling to me. Well, let me just say, (laughs) first of all, uh, I want to thank you because you've been, you've set an incredible example and you've been an unbelievable mentor and have really paved the way with this movement and the advocacy and the work that you do. It has inspired me for many years and it's been a long journey and it's cool that we're both in it to win yeah. it and yeah. still here. And so it's an honor and a privilege to, to talk to you today. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the work you're doing, the number of lives that you're reaching, um, and, and the good service that you're doing, it is anyway, it's just, it's, uh, I'm constantly going, wow, rich way to be, you know, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate you being um, a champion of this vision that I had from the beginning. And I'll never forget, I sent you a manuscript of Finding Ultra before it came out. And I think I was at, at a movie and you called and I ran out of the movie theater <laughs> yeah. to take your call. And you were like so effusive with your praise and so encouraging. And that meant a lot to me at that time. Yeah. Well, and so that book, Finding Ultra, it, um, the reason why I called you immediately, because I, I finished reading, I think it was a galley's copy or something mm-hmm. like that. And you laid it out there. You laid it out there in a big, wonderful, you know, courageous way. Um, the way. The way you were so incredibly honest, the way you uh, left yourself just open to so much vulnerability. And that you know, was definitely the feeling. Um, it, it was it was a very kind of a, vu- a vulnerable place to be to kind of tell your story in that way. But I but I also knew I mean, first of all, backing up, I was aware that Scott Jurek was writing a book at the same time that I was writing my book. And here you have the world's greatest ultra marathoner, you know, vegan, just an incredible human being. And I'm here over here. I've never won a race. You know, I'm this ultra athlete, vegan person. But I'm thinking, why would anyone (laughs) read my book when they can just pick up Scott's? And I was very aware that the value of what I could share was was directly proportionate to the extent to which I was willing to be vulnerable and talk about things I wasn't proud of to try to connect emotionally with the reader. Right. Well, you you did that in spades. And, you know, before this interview, I reread the book. And I again, I was just like. It was so well written, you know, again, the way you open yourself up, um, uh, downright incredible. And, and, it, and it, made, it, it made me kind of go back through my childhood, my life, and explore kind of places where I was vulnerable or not vulnerable. And it just made me think about how, how many, especially I think boys and men these days, they don't allow themselves to be mm. to be to be vulnerable and and for whatever reason we've kind of grown up thinking that showing signs of vulnerability is like a weakness right when reality it, it's probably one of the greatest strengths yeah it's scary we're raised from the beginning to you know put on put on the face the mask and go out into the world and 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 be this you know warrior type personality and i've discovered through pain that there's a lot of strength to be mined in that vulnerability. That's a lesson that I had to learn, though. It didn't come naturally to yeah. me. And I learned it in recovery initially uh, by learning to share my own story and being empathetic and a good listener to other people's stories. Mm. And I realized how much courage it takes to do that and also how much freedom it avails you. Like if you can really put yourself out there in that way and clean that closet out of whatever skeletons you have, then there's a lightness, I think, that comes with that. And it's very empowering. Yeah. Um, Do you now in your life go out of your way to be like vulnerable just to like strengthen or deepen relationships? 
Well, I think I'm always doing an inventory of, of where I'm at and where I'm hiding things and where I'm being, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process. It's not like, oh, I was vulnerable here and now I always am. Like I have to resist the urge to, you know, to present myself in a light that perhaps isn't totally genuine and honest. But I also think now there is a sense that vulnerability can be this superpower. And you see a lot of people doing what I call performative vulnerability, mm -hmm. like on social media, you know, to get the likes or whatever. And I think that's, that's something unique that I would not have expected. And I think there's issues with that um, because there's an ego attachment to that, right? So it's about like then turning the page on that and going even deeper and going even deeper. And it's, it's a practice. I'm sure many of you have read Rich's book, Finding Ultra, and remember his infamous episode when he got winded just by climbing the stairs because he had gotten so out of shape physically and emotionally. It almost seems unthinkable that a former collegiate swimmer could barely climb the stairs at the age of 40, but that was his reality that he had to confront. It was a life-changing moment and a wake-up call to make some serious changes in his life. It also marked a significant moment of realizing that he may be living out a dangerous legacy, that of his late grandfather, Richard Spindle, who also was a world-class swimmer, but had succumbed to a heart attack at an early age, long before Rich was even born. Was Rich sealing his own fate? And I had to know does he feel like his grandfather, Richard, is guiding him? Do you I, still feel I do, an attachment? I do feel that. Like, I, I just took you over to my container office, and I have a team photo of him and also a picture of him in high school in his, in his swimming trunks, you know, the full body yeah, 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 yeah. from the 20s. Um, so I look at him every day, and I think about that. You know, this is a guy who... Um, I'm named after, and if you look at the images, you can see my likeness within him. And he was my mother's father. He was a champion swimmer in the late 20s and, and, and early 1930s, um, captain of the University of Michigan swim team, which was like the Texas or the Stanford of that era. Yeah. Um, his coach was Matt Mann. The, the natatorium at University of Michigan is called the Matt Mann Natatorium. He was a contemporary of, of the Johnny Weissmuellers of his day. And he held an American record in the 150 yard backstroke, which was an event back then. Um, narrowly missed an Olympic berth, um, never smoked, was never overweight, remained fit, swam in Lake Michigan all the time, and nonetheless uh, succumbed to a heart attack at, at age 54. Um, and so I never met him. He died when my mother was in college. And I know that that was a very traumatic experience for her and part of the reason why I was named after her. And here I am, you know, not even attempting, like not really as a child, it wasn't like I knew that much about him. I don't even know that I knew he was a swimmer, but I just gravitated towards it. And it was this dawning realization that in many ways I was walking a similar path. So I actually think about him more now because he was 54 when he died, you know? And, and so it's, it's even more prescient perhaps even than when I was on that staircase or having that, you know, in, in the wake of that, trying to, you know, reconfigure my relationship with food and lifestyle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the first time that you kind of had that, uh, if you want to call it maybe um, that epiphany uh, where something kind of guided you, I think was a certain awakening with mm -hmm. alcoholism, mm -hmm. um, kind of where it was, I think you were at Springbrook Right. And uh, one of the um, the counselors there, I think, said, you know, Rich, change your perception and you can change your reality. And um, I'm just wondering if like looking back over your um, over your life uh, in regards to the alcoholism. Um, do you feel like there's one moment when that kind of took hold of you or was it like going back to when? You were chugging a beer with Bruce Kimball right. on that recruiting trip, because I mean, uh, I, I knew Bruce Kimball, you know, not well, um, 
but uh, and that that story you told in the book where he did a I think a backflip or a front flip. He did a he did holding a, he did a backflip holding a cup of beer and didn't spill a drop. And that yeah. that is something I will never forget. <laughs> yeah. I think you say in the book yeah. the, the ultimate party trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but it was, but is there a point where you can single pinpoint kind of oh yeah that's that's when I was having issues with alcohol or. It, it, there isn't one moment where I can say, here's where I crossed over. It's a very gradual process. Um, but I knew in my heart of hearts and on some unconscious level very early on that I had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol because I was the guy who never wanted to leave the party. I was the last one to leave. I was the guy who wanted to go out on a Tuesday night, you know, when everybody else was studying and yeah. like, I was always kind of pushing the edges of that. Um, so I knew that it was a little bit different for me than it was for other people. And I think, um, in a self-preservation way that prevented me from going down the rabbit hole with hard drugs, because I, I was aware, like, this is a, I know this is a problem. And at some point I'm probably going to have to quit or this is going to get bad. So I'm not going to try cocaine. I'm not going to do those other things because that will just bring this whole house of cards falling on top of itself immediately and I want to keep drinking you know that was like my mindset and it was a gradual process uh, like this erosion of my soul and my ambitions and um, mm. my my ability to even exercise self-care like my window became very limited to where's my next good time and that's really all I cared about uh, but it took a long time before there were serious um, like external ramifications like DUIs and yeah. run-ins with bosses and things like that. I mean, that all happened, but you know, it was many years after that. Epiphanies, they are like a crazy lightning rod of much needed change. I remember an epiphany I had to write the engine two diet after our early plan strong success at the Austin fire department we had gotten a slew of media attention and afterwards we got bombarded with with letters with postcards with emails and phone calls uh, about a bunch of firefighters in austin texas eating a bunch of plants and it was about two and a half months uh, after we appeared on the front of the metro section of the New York Times. And at some point, I just realized, you know what? It's okay that I'm not a doctor, that I'm not a nutritionist, that I'm not a life coach. I, just by being who I am, a ex-professional athlete and a firefighter, have the potential to reach and change people's lives because of who I am. And that's what gave me the confidence to go ahead and, and write my first book, The Engine 2 Diet. So my question is, what epiphanies have you had? Take a step back and really think. Have you experienced any magical moments that spark change? Sometimes it's a song or even an event that happens. Other times, it's through a person that you cross paths with at just the right time. This happened to Rich when he was in rehab for alcoholism. Another thing that happened at Springbrook is uh, one of your counselors, his name was Stan, and he said, you only have to change one thing, Rich. And then he said, everything. Right. I mean, is that... Is that a daunting thing or is that like a, a good thing uh, when somebody says, you only have to do one thing and that's just change everything. Right. It's like a Zen Cohen. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, how do I even do that? Yeah. Um, and I think it was just a, a, a way of saying the way you're living your life is not working, dude. Like you need to open yourself up to the possibility of doing things differently. And I know you think you're this smart guy, but your best thinking landed you here. So take a seat and right. shut up and let, let, you know, be open to 
what we have to offer you. And I need, I needed that. I needed to hear that. Yeah. Well, as you know, I've become good friends with a guy named Adam Sud, mm-hmm. who's been on your podcast. Yeah. And Adam, as you know, became addicted to Adderall. And he felt like Adderall was the key and made him everything that everybody wanted him to be, the person that his father wanted him to be. Um, and it led him to a very, very you know, dark, dark place. And I think in, on reflection, he was, he was perfect. He was that perfect individual snowflake, but he just didn't have the perspective and he, he couldn't see it. And I look at Adam now and I just see, you know, just such a beautiful, amazing human being, right? I mean, you, right? Look at you and just see a, a beautiful, you know, loving, sharing, amazing, amazing man. But for whatever reason, sometimes we can't see in ourselves what other people see. Right. Well, there's been a lot of growth to get me to this place, <laughs> I can tell you. And and I think the thing that's beneath what you're saying is yeah. the fact that that like drugs and alcohol, they're not necessarily the problem. They're like the symptom of the underlying problem. Like they're actually the solution in the early days. Like I was a right. very insecure, quiet, introverted kid who had difficulty making friends and alcohol was my solution. It brought me out of my out of myself. It allowed me to be a social animal. It, it, it taught me how to interact with other people. It ultimately turned on me and it was a very unhealthy vehicle for learning those things. But um, that's the way it goes, right? And I know that Adam's experience with that was similar. And when yeah. it all comes crashing down, you have to relearn all of those skills in a healthy way. And that's kind of the journey to, to wholeness that anybody in recovery takes. Yeah. Um... And I'm, I'm kind of diving into your book here a, a little bit. And, and um, you know, I don't know how often you do this and if, if this is, you know, if it's uncomfortable or not, but I totally just. Totally fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, again, because I just read it, I'm fascinated with it. And I just have some of these burning questions. Um, this is an intense moment in the book. And you say, you know, you, you describe that fateful day when you took a match out and you burned your inventory list of all your resentments, your fears, your, your your harm to others. And then you collected the ashes after you burned it. And to this day, I'm assuming you're still keeping them in a Tibetan uh, singing bowl at your bedside mm-hmm. nightstand. Mm-hmm. Why? I think it's just a very tactile reminder of where I, where I was and what I had to endure and go through to get to the next place. Um, I would say that just because you do an inventory like that doesn't mean it's a one, it's not a one and done thing. (laughs) I got to keep doing inventories. Um, but that was a very seminal moment where I did feel like I had kind of crossed the Rubicon and, and, and was embracing this new way of living and a lifestyle based on spiritual principles in a way that I wouldn't have been able to prior to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Another quote that you have in the book, I have come to appreciate that great beauty lies in destruction. The wedding that almost destroyed me was necessary to my ultimate salvation. And for this, I will always be eternally grateful. I'm just wondering, um, do you feel like you've had several brushes with destruction or? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, pain, the other thing I always say is like pain has been my greatest teacher. There's something about uh, a very painful moment that allows you to kind of wake up and and be teachable. Um, Of course, the teachings are always available, but the receptivity Uh generally isn't. Uh And that's why it's so hard, so difficult for people to change. I mean, you know, in your life, you're helping people change lifelong habits all the time. And you've had a lot of successes, but I'm sure you've had experiences with people who are resistant to it or just can't make it work. And there's something about a scary episode, whether it's bottoming out on drugs and alcohol or having a health scare that suddenly wakes people up and and allows them to step into a different reality for themselves. I just wish it was more accessible. Like, how can we unlock that for people? so that we don't have to suffer in that way in order to get the message. You know what I mean? Right, right. go to that extreme before you're like able to get the help. Uh, So you dedicated Finding Ultra to your wife, Julie. 
Um, you talk about how she's the coolest woman you've ever met, um, how she has taught you not only uh, to love, but also to receive love. What's up with sleeping on a tent on the roof? Is that something that I should like be doing with my wife? <laughs> yeah. Everybody thinks that that's a referendum on our marriage. I mean, Julie and I have been together for 20 years at this point. We have a very solid marriage, um, which doesn't mean we don't fight. We fight, but we have the half-life on our fights is very short. Like we have really great communication skills and we have a, you know, a healthy, robust, you know, intimate life as well. Um, but I've had, especially as I get older, I've had challenges with getting restful sleep. And a couple of years ago, as you know, we have this flat roof out here and we would take the kids up there and we could project movies on this wall and we do sleep, sleep outs like on the roof. And there was one night where I just slept incredibly soundly mm. under the stars on just a sleeping bag on the roof and woke up feeling more refreshed than I had in a long time. And I, and I announced to Julie, like, I'm going to start sleeping on the roof more. Like, this is great. She's like, fine. And then I would wake up with moisture all over me and all wet. So I was like, I'm getting a tent. It just became one thing after another. And I've been sleeping in a tent um, pretty regularly for the last couple of years. And it just, it helps me sleep more soundly. Yeah. Something about the cold, you know, we're in the desert here. So even on yeah. a hot day, it's cold at night being under all those covers. And I just, I just wake up feeling better than I do. You drag a mattress in there. You want to do, I got it. Yeah. I got a mattress in there. It's not like I'm sleeping on the ground. Um, yeah. I've got a little twin mattress in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty true. Good man. I like it. I've, I, I've had my best sleeps on camping trips yeah. in sleeping bags on a pad. Yeah. Where you're like in tune with, you know, mother nature. Right. So I feel, I feel more connected to the earth that way. It's yeah. kind of a primal thing. And I, and I also think it's a little bit of a stoic practice. Like I, I'm incredibly blessed to live in this amazing house in this amazing area. Um, and that does not escape me, but I sleep in a tent and you saw my little shipping container where I work out of like, that's kind of my little world back there. So if everything went away, like it all just disappeared on me, like I've realized like I don't need that much, you know, I have a lot, um, and I like nice things and all of that, but, um, but I'll be okay. And I think that that helps me um, calibrate my compass and how I make decisions about how I want to invest my time. Yeah. Um, in that, that thing I just, I read just before the sleeping on the roof with a tent. Uh -huh. um, you talk about how Julie also taught you how to receive love. Yeah. Uh, why do you think it's so hard for so many people to receive love? We don't feel, we feel we're not worthy for some reason of it. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for other people. I can only speak for myself, but I certainly didn't feel worthy of it. Or I felt like if somebody was was um, directing, you know, directing that towards me, that it felt indulgent or undeserved. Mm -hmm. And I've had to learn how to be a gracious receiver of of, of love and and other good things in my life. You know, because I do I do feel like I have a deep seated. Um, sense of unworthiness that I'm constantly trying to work on and overcome. Let's talk about your your, your plant-based lifestyle. You credit that for kind of transforming a lot of things in your life, mm -hmm. uh, going from a couch potato to Ultraman uh, triathlete, and then doing that you know crazy epic five that you did. Mm -hmm. um, do you ref refer to your way of eating as vegan or plant-powered way or what? How do you refer to it? I, uh, it, you know, the labels get tricky, you know, because people get really caught up in them and everybody has different definitions of what these things mean. Um, I would say, you know, I plant powered, plant strong, you know, plant strong is your thing. I mean, I, I'm not completely oil free, so I don't feel like I can own that moniker. Um, I like plant powered, um, uh, plant based. Um, but I, you know, I got into this initially for health reasons, which we can talk about a little bit more, but, um, as I've, as I've been doing this for over 12 years at this point, um, I've become a lot more interested in the environmental 
yeah. uh, ramifications and considerations of our daily food choices, um, as well as uh, the compassionate considerations around animal welfare, which were not considerations when I got into this and have now become very important to me. Um, so I do consider myself vegan, although that would depend on, you know, the varying definitions of how people perceive that term. Right. You know, the word vegan implies um, a political perspective and a certain sense of activism that perhaps I don't, you know, I, I, I don't embody completely, but I do it in my own, in my own way. Right. Through the podcast and the other things that I do. Right. And then you also got into this for obviously for, for health reasons mm -hmm. and that the, um, that one comment I made earlier about, you know, you going up the stairs and then, um, kind of having this kind of epiphany, like, wow, you know what? I got to make some changes. And for whatever reason, it's stuck there. I think maybe the Richard, uh, Spindle, um, that he, he died at 53, 54, 54, 54 yeah. you said, and, and for whatever reason it impacted you. So you used the plant powered way to kind of fuel you back to health, right? Where were you? Well, what happened was, uh, I had that moment on the staircase, tightness in the chest and kind of, you know, really afraid that I was on the precipice of something serious. And I did think about my grandfather, um, but I was very aware that I was having a moment not dissimilar to the day I decided to go off to treatment for alcoholism. Like mm. these line in the sand moments that I think can be determinative in terms of the trajectory that you take for your life. Like had I woken up that morning when I was 31 and decided I'll go to rehab tomorrow and not today, maybe I would have never made it there. Like I think there's something about these moments that are, that are precious and fleeting. And if we're present enough and we have the wherewithal to, to kind of recognize um, their significance, they do hold the power to change our lives in dramatic ways. So when I was on the staircase, I thought of that day that I went off to rehab and I realized like, this is another one of those moments. Like I feel that it's, it's all about, it's about willingness. Like I, I had, it wasn't just like, Hey, I should, I really need to change how I'm living. It's like, I actually want to, like, I, not only do I need to, like, I want to, and I need to bottle this and protect it and channel it immediately because tomorrow I might just change my mind. So I grabbed onto it and that's what kind of led me on this path of self-discovery and this changing relationship with, with, with food. And I have to tell you that a big part of it was me doing some research and figuring out, okay, what do I want to do? How do I do this? What, what's, what's the path forward here? And it was, a, it was around the, I, I was like on Facebook and I came across your page. I think we were already friends or, and I, we didn't know each other, but I knew your name from swimming. Yeah. And, um, and I was just scrolling on your, your feed and you were, you were in the process. I mean, engine two hadn't come out yet, but you were, I think you were writing at the, at the time and you were talking about plant-based nutrition and what was going on in the firehouse and the work that your dad was doing. And I didn't know about any of that. So you were my introduction to that. And I thought this guy was a swimmer at Texas. All this right. guy was a badass, And like, he's doing this, like, that is a model that I could copy. And so you were like my lighthouse and lightning rod for, um, for modeling like a way of living that I thought that I could emulate. And, you know, I didn't do it overnight. It was six or seven months of fooling around before I yeah. finally kind of figured it out for myself. But that was the starting point. Well, and, and it, it's kind of funny how uh, Julie, I think at first didn't think you were serious and, right. you know, you, you, you had to say like, Hey, I really want to do this like three or four times. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you started with the juice, the juice cleanse. Yeah. I did and, a juice yeah. cleanse. Like I, I kind of approached it like rehab. Like there were, there was something about the experience of being in recovery that was very applicable to changing my habits with food in that in, in recovery, you're either you're either using or you're not like, it's very black and white. It's very binary. You can't like drink once in a while and claim to be sober. So I just applied that kind of mindset to food and thought, well, animal pro I'll just think of animal products like drugs and alcohol yeah. and I can just cut them out. And that removed the decision fatigue out of the whole thing. And I just took the tools that I've 
learned in 12 step and applied them to my relationship with food, which also taught me the extent to which I was using food in an addictive way to modulate my emotional state, which was mm-hmm. news to me. I didn't think that I was doing that, but right. I very much was. And that really helped me to not just start, but create momentum behind these new habits. Right. And then you brought Julie all the way to being like all plant-based, right? Right. So Julie was, you know, what most people would consider to be a very clean eater. She was predominantly vegetarian and everything that she bought was organic and she is a gifted cook and would prepare these amazing meals while I was going to Jack in the Box and McDonald's. Like that was her thing, yeah, right? Yeah. She wasn't totally plant-based, but when I made the switch and was experiencing this kind of uh, resurgence in my vitality and my energy levels, um, she then in, initially in solidarity to me, got on board with it um, to support me, but then completely embraced embraced it herself and has gone on to write all these cookbooks and you know become yeah. an ambassador of the movement in her own right got selling the cheese yeah i know well she's starting this this new cheese line she's got um she's got a commercial kitchen now she, i'll tell you about it afterwards but <laughs> yeah. like there's a whole thing going on there yeah it's wow. pretty cool wow yeah um so you're getting back in shape you decide you know i don't want to just do a normal piddly triathlon that's not that's not rich roll right so you got to dive in you got to do something crazy and i think it was you were reading something about david goggins you know right. this, this beast that had done the the ultraman right mm-hmm. and that for whatever reason caught your attention it very much did <laughs> i mean first of all it, it, you know it wasn't like i felt like oh you know, regular triathlons are beneath me. Like I did, I attempted to do the wildflower half Ironman and DNF'd it. Like I did not have like an auspicious, yeah. you know, introduction to the world of endurance, but I did come across this article. I mean, David Goggins has become a household name now. You know, this guy's like, you know, his, his ascendancy is incredible and well-deserved. Um, but at the time, nobody knew who David Goggins was. He was doing amazing things in the ultra endurance world, but outside of that very small subculture, yeah. nobody knew who he was. And he had just run Badwater and a number of weeks later had competed in this race called Ultraman, a double Ironman distance uh, triathlon in, in Hawaii and had gotten like second place despite his bike break. It was this crazy story. And there was something about the fact that he wasn't a natural triathlete you know, not really a swimmer, but he had, had been able to not only finish this thing, but do well, that, that triggered something in me and, and, and made me think that's, that's where I need to go. And that's where you went. <laughs> that's where I went. Yeah. And then you, and then, and then, and then, yeah. and then how many years did you do Ultraman? I did it. My first one was in 2008. Um, and that was just, can I finish this thing and, and survive? Mm-hmm. And I ended up, I think 11th yeah. that year. I did pretty well. Probably um, learned a lot about it. I learned it. a lot. Yeah, I learned a lot. So I went back the next year intent on racing it. Um, led the race by 10 minutes after the first day. Crashed my bike on the second day, yeah. which took me out of podium contention. And um, But I was able to, it, I broke my pedal. It's like a whole crazy story, but was yeah. able to kind of get everything sorted out and back on the bike and complete the race. And I was the, I think I was the fastest American. I think I got sixth, if I'm not mistaken, yep. that year. Yeah. Yep. And then, and then what, it was a year or two later, you and you and a buddy decided to do the, uh, the Epic five. Yeah. This guy, Jason Lester, who I trained with and raced with at Ultraman, who's an incredibly inspiring human being. He does all of these races without the functional use of his right arm. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, and it was his idea. He's, he had this crazy harebrained idea to try to do five Ironmans on five wine islands in, in, in five days. And, well, how he long, how recruited lo- <laughs> me into this nonsense. Yeah, but were you, so he suggested, are you like, that's insane, I don't want any part of it? Or are you like, let me think about it? Or are you like, oh yeah, I'm in? No, I, <laughs> I, was, I thought I was like done. I was like, I, I have proved everything I need to prove to myself, enough suffering for now. And meanwhile, like I was starting to get attention, like CNN did a thing on me and like the men's fitness, 25 yeah. fit, I was like, I was like, I'm good. You know, I, I don't need, why, why go out and suffer more, you know? And he, it was his idea to do this thing. He didn't ask me initially. And I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. Like, let me know how I can support you. He finally asked me and I was like, I got to really think about that. And, and ultimately, you know, to be completely frank, 
the amount of time I had been spending training, that's time away from my kids and my family yeah. and my wife. And it was like, it's time for them now. Like I need to repay that debt and be a present dad and, you know, get back to, um, you know, what's most important in life. So it was a family decision and Julie was very encouraging. She, she said, I think you should do this. And so that's how it, that's how it happened. Well, you're, you're right. I mean, so I have something here where basically Julie, if I'm not mistaken, you were, I don't know if it was, you were training for the Ultraman or maybe Epic five, but you, uh, you bonked like 60 miles away. You had to make it home and you're like, what am I doing? Right. And then Julie kind of gave you one of a, you know, one of her, I guess, patented pep talks. And uh, the next day you went out and you ran 40 miles and you were there. I'm wondering, like, does Julie, does Julie have to pull you aside very often and give you these kind of pep talks? And well, she's very good at seeing the big picture. And, you know, for context during this time and for an extended period of time, like it was very difficult financially. Like I was practicing law less and less. I'm doing more and more of this training. Like it doesn't make any logical sense. There's no, there's no career path here. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was really hard. And so I had back to this issue of masculinity. Like I called into question my trajectory many times. Like, why am I doing this? Like, why do I feel compelled to do this? Um, you know, I should be trying to get a job at a law firm. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. Like, it's very emasculating to not be able to provide to the extent that you feel capable of, right? And every time I had those sort of, you know, crises of faith, she was the one who said, no, like, to me, it's clear the path. You have to follow this path. Like, the answers that you're searching about yourself and about how we're going to move forward as a family are going to be answered by continuing to pull on this thread, not by retreating and going back to what you know. Yeah. And so by holding that line, which, by the way, everybody thought we were insane. And we had friends and family members constantly saying, like, what are you doing? Like, this is this doesn't make any sense. But it was her conviction that allowed me to to, you know, continue along this path that, like, allows me to even be talking to you today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that what you said in the book was, yeah, when your purpose aligns with your faith. Right. right? And it's like, it, it, it happens. Like the yeah. universe opens up. It doesn't up. happen the way you want it to, or <laughs> it certainly doesn't happen on your timeline. I can tell you that. Yeah. Well, well so you just mentioned that you had, you had, um, had a period there where financially it was kind of rough. Mm -hmm. you, did you have to like, did you retreat to like, was it Hawaii or something like that? Or maybe retreat's the wrong word, but um, and yeah, we were very close to losing our house. We had had cars repossessed. It got so bad at one point that they took our trash bins away. Like we couldn't pay our, our bill to have our trash, col trash collection you know, <laughs> taken care of. I mean, it was bad and it was hard and it was embarrassing, really embarrassing. Um, and on that notion of like, when you're, when your heart is true, you know, that the universe will conspire to support you. That's in my book, and, and the book had come out, and I felt strongly about that, and I thought, um, and I poured everything into getting the book out there when it came out, trusting that if I do this and put my all into it, that some door will open at some point, and the, you know, the path forward will be revealed, and that wasn't happening. Like, we were in the aftermath of the book coming out, and, you know, I could go speak at a veg fest for no money, but... I was struggling to figure out how I was going to put food on the uh, on the table. And the thought of going back and doing any kind at this of point, entertainment oh, law at this was... point, it would have just felt like defeat. Okay. Right. So I was fully invested at this point in trying to figure out how I was going to create a career out of this. Um, and we've had discussions about this over the years, and and you know you created a model for how how you had done it, um, and I needed to figure out my own version of that for myself, and was struggling. Um, and then I got a call from a friend and it was all, he had also, he had read Finding Ultra and he was inspired and he was a big, you know, business, successful business guy who had bought this property on the North shore of Kauai called Common Ground. And he was trying to figure out what to do with it. It was this organic farm. And he's like, I'm, I don't know what, I, why I want to do this, but I feel like I want your help in helping me figure out how I can turn this property into something more than just a farm like I want to do a community space or I don't even know but like I just feel like you would be a good person to help me figure that out and like 
I don't know why, you know, like I was like, it's not this, like I have experience in property development or anything like that, but this yeah. was, this was the one phone call and opportunity that we had. And he was willing to fly my whole family out to Hawaii and, and, you know, pay us for the, for basically consulting. And we went and did it and lived in these yurts on this farm for a couple months. Um, what did you do here? Did you, did you rent this out? So no, it was just like, we, I wasn't sure that, you know, we were going to be able to hang on to the house. And I thought maybe we're just moving to Hawaii now. Like maybe we're going to be living in these yurts and we're not going to go back. Like it was a very uncertain time. Um, and I was very grateful for that opportunity. Like it's, he literally saved us. Uh, but I, but after being on that remote Island for a period of time, I started to get a little bit antsy. I was feeling very disconnected and I'd worked so hard to try to begin a conversation around these ideas that I, that I felt strongly about and cultivating a little bit of community around that. And it felt like I unplugged that plug. And that's when the idea to start the podcast happened. It was just a creative impulse, like a, a way to continue the conversation that the book started. And my oh my, what amazing conversations he's been having the last seven years. What started as a podcast with his wife in a yurt in Hawaii has turned into one of the most popular podcasts on the planet with thought leaders, actors, authors, and, and more. He's now inspired millions of people through his thoughtful dialogue around plant-based nutrition and activism. And most certainly, there have been episodes that have also left a lasting impression on him. Well, there, I, mean, I had this conversation with this guy called Rip Esselstyn. <laughs> at yeah. some point what episode was that oh shoot like two years come ago. on man that was um it's not like that like everybody yeah. who comes comes on the show uh has something to offer and i learned from that person but it's not like it ends up on a list and that becomes a daily habit it's more like it goes into the gray matter and gets synthesized in some way yeah you know yeah um so it's not you know i mean it's i've learned a lot about you know you, I was very conscious from the beginning that, look, it's not going to be a fitness triathlon podcast. It's not going to be strictly a plant-based podcast. Like I want to have a, a very broad aperture to learn from all different kinds of people to continue my own personal growth um, trajectory. So yeah, I've had people on entrepreneurs, business people, musicians, actors, doctors, athletes, like all kinds of people. And you know, I've learned I've learned something from every single person. And the amazing thing is that, as you know, I'm sure, there's something about the formality, the structure of, of recording a conversation like this that makes you very present and aware of what's happening. And there's a connection that takes place. So mm -hmm. after you've had that, it's like you've shared you have the shared experience with another human being and that human being is impacted by it as well. Yeah. And neither of you will forget it. And so these people become important people in my life. They become friends and colleagues and mentors and advisors in different ways. Let me ask you this. What is it about you? What it kind of is it about me that we kind of seek out suffering and pain? Do you think it's because of the swimming background and just we had that we have this idea that, you know, you know, no pain, no gain mm -hmm. and that we feel like, okay, if I can be totally obliterated at the end of the day, I've had a successful day in like training. Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of it. That's probably the unhealthy part of it. Like I have to suffer. I don't feel like I did anything today that's worthy. Um, but I think the healthy part of that is that human beings are hardwired to, to, uh, I think we need challenges, difficulties, in a physical sense through suffering in order to connect with who we are. Like it is a teacher. And I think it, it, when you, when you are in that place of pushing yourself and your heart rate is elevated and you're in some level of discomfort, um, it's empowering and it makes you present. And it, it's, it's like this experience that, how do I, how do I put this in words that I think, um, reveals character and 
uh, is a very honest truth teller about who you are and where you're at in your life. Mm. You know, it creates a it creates a an honesty, right? There's a purity to it, and I think we're all living comfortable lives of luxury ensconced in in cubicles and driving in air conditioned cars and sleeping in air conditioned bedrooms. Uh, and we've lost that tactile relationship with our bodies and with the earth. Yeah. And it's no mistake, therefore, that that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people run marathons every year and you're seeing the tough mutters and the Spartan races and all these and, and the explosion of the ultra running, uh, you know, subculture. All of these are indicia to me that we've become too comfortable and that there is something about that experience that is fun, that fundamentally, you know, makes us human. Yeah. Do you feel any urge, desire, itch to like put a carrot out there again for you? Are you like just satisfied going for your, you know, your runs and your bikes in this amazing, you know, area here? Well, because I do, I do, I do. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I like you, like if I, you know, we probably both have buddies that, that think about like that one weekend a year, they get to go to Vegas and play golf with their buddies. Like, I don't fantasize about that. I fantasize about like, what would it be like if I just moved into a cabin in the woods and all I had to do was train all day long, every day, you know, like that sounds to me like heaven, you know what I mean? Like I need that in my life. I live a very busy, complicated life now, and I don't have the time bandwidth to do that. And I have to make peace with that. I still carve out enough time for self care to get out on the trails and, 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 and experience, have that experience in my life. Um, and I do have the yearning to go and test myself, but I don't know. I don't know that I need to go and do some super crazy thing that no one's ever done before, yeah. but I do feel like it's important for me to stay connected to that world. Yeah. Like whether it's, once a year, once every two years, you know, getting out of my comfort zone and doing something that scares me a little bit. I think that that's important. How can you be more honest with yourself and how can you test yourself in a way that that scares you and makes you uncomfortable? And I think the more that you do that, the more alive you feel yeah. and the more present you are in the other areas of your life. When you look at that event that, that uh, uh, Jesse Itzler uh -huh. uh, has every year, right? Yeah. Where people... I did it. I just did it in Utah. Oh, it was, how was it? It was incredible. <laughs> Jesse Itzler, is an, he's an amazing human being. He doesn't have to do any of this stuff. Like He's got a great life and he's all set, right? Yeah. But he created this event called 29029, which involves rent. He rents out a mountain, like a ski resort, because that is the elevation of Mount Everest. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And the idea is you hike up a mountain and then you, you take the gondola down and you repeat until you have achieved the, the altitude of Mount Everest, 29,029 feet. Um, and on paper, it doesn't sound that hard. You're like, oh, you just hike and you take the gondola down. Like how hard can it be? Um, I did the one in Utah this past summer. And it was like a 2.3 mile hike up the mountain with, I can't remember how much elevation gained, but you had to do it 13 times in order to achieve that. And you have 36 hours to do it. It was hard. It was hard. And what was cool, I mean, I was doing it with my hardcore endurance buddy. So it wasn't like, it wasn't going to break us. Like we were having fun and taking our time. But what was great about it was that it wasn't a race. They don't even keep track of of like who's in the lead or anything like that, it's irrelevant. It's 250 people that are there to have a shared collective experience doing something difficult and getting out of their comfort zone. And the majority of these people hadn't really ever done anything like that before. These aren't hardened Ironman athletes. These are like everyday executives who, who you know are trying to like connect with themselves in a different way. And to see these people endure like this isn't a 10k that's over in half an hour like yeah. these people went through the night they didn't sleep they just went 36 hours straight until they finished it with headlamps on hiking you up too? this mountain you, you too we did we did 10 um and then it was like 10 or 11 at night and we hit the hay and woke up the next morning and, and completed it now, so but it took it took like from six in the morning to 10 at night to get 10 yeah. in yeah and you don't you don't just sign up and do this i mean did you train specifically for this 
I, I mean, I should have. I didn't really. You didn't. I mean, oh. I'm out trail running all the time, but I didn't yeah. do like training specific for this. Yeah. So how, how how ugly did they get for you? It was it was. Uh, did you have to dig into the pain cave? It was hard. I mean, the el- yeah. the 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 altitude was was tricky for me. I mean, a little bit into the pain cave, but you know, it wasn't like you would have you would have killed it. Oh no 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 no! You should do it too. It was no, fun. No, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, you know, I'm swimming. Mr. These... Masters world record holder. Yeah, yeah. No, that 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 was I'm I'm glad I got that one. But um no, I I swim, I do a little bit of biking. Uh-huh. The, the running I'm not doing so much of. Yeah. Dogs love adventure as much as humans and while they may not be doing a Mount Everest challenge up a mountain like Jesse Itzler. They do need the energy and fuel to run, climb, and play just like we do. Wild Earth Dog Food provides that source of energy with whole, plant-based, clean protein in their formula so that your dog can live a life of adventure right alongside you. Try it today by visiting the episode place at plantstrongpodcast.com to claim up to 50% off your order. I'm just I'm just naming off some people here because I just have found them to be so moving, like Paul De Gelder, right? Right. The shark you attack. Should ha- you should talk to him for your podcast. Oh, I did season one. You did. Oh, I good. did. I did. Uh-huh. He was he was spectacular. Yeah. But you know, one of the things I'll just let's talk about this for a sec with 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 Colin crossing the Antarctica with Paul De Gelder and, and the shark mm-hmm. attack, and now he's as you know, the uh, the host of of Shark Week on mm-hmm. the Discovery Channel, and it seems like they're always kind of pushing him to do the next kind of crazy thing, right? For, for ratings and stuff like that. And Colin, like, is he going to have to do something to, to top what he just did? Right. And it's like, at what point are you like, you know what? Enough's enough. I don't have to like, uh, put my life on the line again and again yeah. and again. Like there's something about what you just said, like the, the, the athlete who's so attached to going further and longer and just can't, you know, can't ever get off that horse, um, that I think is, or can be unhealthy. Um, and I've had this conversation with Ross Edgley who swam around Great Britain. Did you you hear about that? No. All the way around Great Great Britain and the Iron Cowboy who did 50 Ironmans in 50 States in 50 days. It's like, once you have a taste of a crazy adventure like that and you succeed, it's like, okay, what's next and what's next? And there's pressure. Like now you got to top it and you got to do this. And I think you can chase that dragon to, um, to a dark place. And at some point, I think the greater journey is about becoming emotionally whole. Like, Mm. are you chasing that for ego or is there something you still need to discover about yourself in the world by virtue of doing that and having an honest conversation with yourself about, about the motivation behind it, I think is really important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you feel it? You said you're 53. Yeah. Yeah. At 53, um, with where you are right now in your life, you content? I am, you know, I am. People ask me what's next or what's the big, what's the big vision? Like, what are you working on? And I have ambitions and things that I'm working on and projects that excite me. But if this is all that it is, if tomorrow the lights go out, I'm good. (laughs) You know, I, I, I don't need yeah. anything more than what I have. Right. You know, I don't need it. Look, if the podcast gets bigger, that's great. If I can get the, what, I, but you know, truly like I've built this thing. I have this platform. I have the privilege and the responsibility to, you know, shepherd an audience of people to a better place in their lives, to be an agent, a provocateur of positive change. And that's such a gift. Like I can't think of, of anything I'd rather do with my life mm-hmm. and I'm fully engaged in it. It's incredibly meaningful and, and, uh, rewarding. Um, and it, it doesn't need to be anything other than it is, you know, I mean, I want for nothing. Like I just, like I told you, I just have my birthday and 
Julie's like, what do you want for your birthday? And I was like, I don't, want, I don't need yeah. anything. You're like, I just want, I want to be with my family and I want to experience love, yeah. you know? And so my, my goals are how can I deepen the intimacy that I have with my wife and my kids and, you know, raise them to be the best humans that I'm capable of, of doing. And, you know, I get to do, turn on these mics and do this thing. And occasionally out, people ask me to come and talk to them or whatever. Like, it's all, it's all gravy, man, you yeah. know? And, and so I guess it's my version of what Paul de Gelder had to say. Like, I don't fear death because I feel very alive and fulfilled in what I'm doing. Hmm. Um, I don't feel like I have unfinished business and, and I'm just, I'm grateful for what I have. And I didn't have to get bitten by a shark to experience <laughs> that. You know what I mean? You got bitten by other things. Yeah. But yeah, uh, you, you recently did your big live podcast right. with, with Paul Hawken. Uh -huh. um, was that just lights out gangbusters? Were you thrilled with how that turned out? It was incredible. It was incredible. Um, Does it make you want to do more of those? Yeah. I mean, the idea was knock it out of the park with that one, establish that I can fill a room of 1,100 people so that I can engender the confidence of venue bookers yeah. across America and set up a tour for next year. So yeah, I'm still ambitious. Like that's kind of the evolution of the podcast. And I think a big part of that is the fact that, that it makes this digital thing analog, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. we're, we're having this conversation and it's real for us, but it's an abstraction for everyone that's going to listen to it. Um, how can you, how can you cultivate greater communi communi you know, community and connectivity amongst the people who are impacted by it? Well, you do that by bringing them together, right? Um, and that's what I wanted to do. And, and we learned a lot through that experience. Um, I mean, to have Paul, like that guy's amazing, you know, yeah. what, a, what a beautiful human being he is and the work that he's doing. So the whole thing was like really an extraordinary experience mm -hmm. and I can't wait to do more of them. Mm -hmm. And then here, you right in, in the studio, I mean, you have people like maybe the vast majority of your guests now probably come here, right? Yeah. And they do it here. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't always that <laughs> no, way. I, I was a traveling <laughs> salesman for a long time. Yeah, I know. Um, and you know, occasionally like I still take my kit when I go, when I, when I get on a plane and go somewhere so I can grab interviews here and there. But for the most part, 95% of them now, I, you know, I have people yeah. come here to do it. And so I'm looking at this chalk wall here and you usually have the, the, the person that you interviewed their name right there and maybe, you know, some drawings. Do you do that? Yeah, I do that. You do? Yeah. And so is, is that kind of um, help get you into that headspace? And, uh, a little bit. Like, I think it's a nice touch for the is. guests, too, because they come in and they're like, that actually took time for that guy to do that. Like, yeah. I feel welcome. Yeah. You know, it's going to be OK. Like, it's a way of saying this is a this is a this is a warm place where um, mm. where uh you know, you can feel comfortable. When you look in the mirror, do you like what you see? Most of the time. Yeah, I, I, I hear yeah. you there. I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, you know, I'm very much a work in progress. You know, I, was, I got plenty of flaws and you know, things that I, that I could do better, for sure. Yeah. Um, it's, at some point recently, I think I heard you say that it was on one of your, maybe your Instagram stories or something like that about how the podcasts have just been a diversion from you writing, I think, yeah. another book or more books. And I heard that and I was like, bullshit. I, now, now, just hear uh -huh. me out here. Yeah. And I was like, bullshit. I go, you, there, you've probably got, and I don't know, I'm just making shit up right now, but 10 million, 20 million downloads of your podcasts over the years. There's no way. It's a little bit higher than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Times that by four. Wow. Three or four. Wow. That's, that's yeah. okay. It's phenomenal. But I don't see any book having that kind of reach. Yeah. So if, if your goal is to reach people, mm -hmm. I think what you're doing with the podcast is like, is spot on. Right. So, I mean, so. Anyway, yeah. I, just, I mean, it's, that's true. Like I can, that, that. That's a that's the most powerful argument against writing another book. Like I flick on a mic and I reach way more people than than you know, if I was to write a book, I gotta take a year and a half and focus intently and deeply on that. And it might reach 
a fraction of the audience that I'm reaching every, every, every single week on the podcast. However, I still think that the written word has its place and there is an ephemeral quality about the podcast. Like it's, you know, nobody goes back and listens to episode 10, you know, it's like, it's kind of, that's ancient history, right? But there's a permanence to yeah. a book and, you know, a tactile experience um, that comes with that, that I think is important. And I, and I do, I do feel like, um, you know, I have a facility for writing and I do have things I want to say. And it's hard when you're doing the podcast. All, I mean, this really is a full-time job pretty much. So yeah. um, carving out the time to do it just becomes harder and harder and easier to dismiss. Yeah. Well, and then and then the, the write ups you do for each. Uh, yeah, podcast I spent all this guests. time on that. I don't think anyone reads it or cares, but I care. Oh, I, I want yeah. you to know that I do, and I'm like, wow. I mean, Rich, Rich really put some time and thought and yeah. energy into that, and it's it's usually a, I think a very beautiful synopsis of you know of the interview, and and, and it actually it, it makes me hungry to like want to dive in and listen to it. I'm glad to hear that, but I've often thought like, why did I start doing that? Because then I established that I do that, yeah, and now no, I have to keep yeah. doing it. Yeah. You know, whereas everybody else with a podcast just writes a <laughs> sentence, you know, or like two sentences, and I, and yeah. and now it's like oh, I have to do this flowing thing because you know I was doing I'm putting up a show tonight. So before you got here, I was I probably took I probably spent two hours on. Oh, you know, writing that little write-up right. about the guest that's going up tonight. And then I think, this is crazy. This is a crazy use of my time. But I don't know. I can't I can't stop doing it. Well, you know, um, I enjoy reading it. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> I feel better. <laughs> uh, you and I have been in the plant-based space for well, well over a decade, mm -hmm. right? Um I feel like we are at a pretty amazing place where this thing is going to just bust wide open. The, the, we're going to see a tsunami fall upon us. Um, are you feeling the same way? 100%. 100%. I mean, look around. The mainstreaming of the plant-based movement is undeniable, whether it's the Game Changers documentary or... It's the proliferation of all these plant-based food companies. Yeah. I mean, the plant-based food sector, the plant-based milks, uh, plant-based dairy products, the meat analogs, all of this, this is the fastest growing, most robust part of our economy right now in many ways. There are venture capital funds established solely to invest in these types of companies. Totally. That is something that would have been unheard of. And I know when you and I first started trying to figure out how to how to like blaze a career in this world, a lot of people were like, you can't like make a living doing this, right? Like you can do it as a side hustle, but you're going to have to get a job at some point. And to see this, um, this embrace of this lifestyle that both of us have been advocating for so long in such a ma at such massive scale is unbelievable. I mean, we are if we haven't reached the tipping point yet, we're we're inching up to it pretty quickly here. Yeah. No, I I read an article just the other day that talked about how by 2030, the livestock, just you know, animal agriculture mm -hmm. will be obsolete. Right. It's gonna be death by a thousand cuts. Just, the uh, the podcast that I put up earlier this week was with Pat Brown from Impossible Foods, and that was like that's the drum that he's beating. And yeah. you know, his ambition, his mission is audacious like to end animal agriculture but yeah. look at the impact that his company has already had in yeah. that space and ask him and he'll tell you he's just starting as will ethan brown and yeah. everybody else who's in that space yeah well and the other thing besides um i guess you call them these these plant-based meats but there's also going to be there's this thing called precision fermentation where it's almost like you're actually you know growing you know, beef, chicken, right. whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's right now, it's just the cost, you know, to, to grow it is so ridiculous. But the prediction is by 2030, it'll be 10 times cheaper than what it is right now to basically, you know, grow a cow, right. cut it up, all that stuff. And I mean, so whether it's plant-based, whether it's actual animal that's grown in, in a cell in a lab, actual, you know, animals out in the fields, wherever they are, you know, uh, in pens, that's going to be obsolete. No yeah. more. No more. 
You're right, it'll be eradicated just like smoking cigarettes is less than 20% of the population is now smoking cigarettes, right? 93% of the population mm -hmm. now is what? Now eating meat, right? Mm -hmm. and meat byproducts. So that would be cool. If 2030, we can get Strange to times. below 20% of America eating it's meat. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and then, and then everywhere I look, climate change, right? Yeah. That, people weren't talking about this no. 10 years ago. What's great is that now there are so many entry points for people to embrace this lifestyle. So somebody who's not compelled by the health argument or by the, the, you know, the compassion argument uh, very well may be moved by the environmental concerns of our food choices or you know, any version thereof. So um, I just think it broadens the lens and allows more people to see the incredible benefits of yeah. living this way. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm wondering like, in how many years is it gonna, there's gonna be such a stigma associated with eating meat mm -hmm. that it's similar to like smoking cigarettes. It's like, uncool, uncool yeah, dude. Totally, and on top of that, how about the civil rights argument? Like I think that we will look back on the way that we've treated all these animals and just be appalled, right? And think how could people have done that in yeah. the way that we look back on the way that we've treated indigenous cultures. Yep, yep, absolutely. Like you said when uh, you first interviewed me, I think it was in late December, maybe 2016, you said it checks every box. Yeah. Right? It checks every box. Right, it's like it's rigged. <laughs> Nature rigged it. And they're like, why don't you, can't you see what's right in front of you? Yeah, you yeah. Know? totally. And now people are waking up and realizing that. Ooh. One of the things that I'm trying to get better at, and I'd love to get your advice, opinion, is being mindful in, um, in maybe starting a, a, a meditative practice. The only form of meditation that I do these days is I go out and I swim, I go out for a bike, maybe a run. So it's like meditation in motion, Yeah. but I don't ever really sit still. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering what, any recommendation, how do I start? Uh, are, are the benefits instantaneous? Does it take a while? The benefits are not instantaneous. Uh, it's sort of like getting back into the pool when you haven't swum in a couple of years. Like you're going to have to, you know, go through some discomfort before you start to see results. Or when you begin a new dietary protocol, it's not going to happen overnight. But you're comfortable with that. You know what that process is like. And I think for myself, for many years, I sort of just said or you know declared that my meditation was riding my bike or going to the pool or, or running um, and i thought that it was the same thing and i said that's my meditation what i've realized is that there is a qualitative difference between a formal meditation practice and the kind of active meditation mindfulness that you mm. that you get from physical activity um, and the difference really is in, there's something about cultivating a practice of stillness that allows you to be present in your life and be the observer, the objective observer of your experience from a more detached perspective at the very least in a very tangible way it gives you like that extra it's almost like time slows down and you have that extra moment like let's say you're walking into a situation where you know it could be fraught with conflict or somebody's going to push your buttons rather than just instinctively react like you always do and, and perpetuate whatever cycle you have with that individual, you get that extra moment. And you can think like, not think, you can, you can calibrate your response. Um, and that in and of itself is like a superpower. Mm. You know, just, just be like, oh, I was gonna say that, but like actually it'd be better if I said this, or what am I really trying to do here? or where is that person really coming from? You know, that is like a huge thing, I think. Um, and I, it's just allowed me to be 
more aware of when I'm like running a pattern as opposed to actually coming from a conscious place or the best version of what I have to offer a situation. Uh, how long ago would you say you and Ernest started uh, your your practice? I mean, you know, first of all, let's be clear: like I'm not perfect at this, and I yeah. do it in like sp I'll go I'll go I'll go on runs, and then I'll get interrupted, and then I get back to it, and it's like you know I I could I could be a lot better with the consistency of my practice, but I do know I mean it was it was I don't know how many years ago, but maybe five five or six years ago, um, I started doing it with some regularity. And like I said, I'll have seasons where I'm really good and then I get off and I have to get back on. But when I'm doing it consistently every day, mm -hmm. anywhere from usually 20 minutes, but sometimes it's five or 10, um, you know, 30 days into that, like you start to really feel different. And you, you, you have to kind of do that to get to that place where you can recognize mm -hmm. the benefits of it, just like anything else. Mm -hmm. Do you and Julie uh, talk much about your your meditative practice she's much further down the line in turn like her practice is like she doesn't let anything get interfere with like her morning situation she's really good about and what, it what kind of time does she carve out usually for that i mean she'll do like you know she'll also combine it with like tea and journaling and it's, it's like a whole thing i mean it's probably a 40 minute thing that uh -huh. she does but she'll wake up at like four in the morning four thirty in the morning hmm. pretty regularly to do it yeah i i, I know in your um you had an interview with uh, Tim Ferriss uh -huh. where he went to this Vipassana course. And I, right. know, I know about it because I have a younger brother, Zeb, who's been to like 10 of them. And oh, it's wow. 10 days, uh -huh. a vow of silence. Right. And you're just basically, you know, meditating. And uh, I think Tim was saying it almost pushed him over the edge. Yeah. In, in his interview with you. Yeah. He was like, uh, I don't necessarily recommend <laughs> no, it. You know, no. it sounded like really hard. And I've heard that from other people as well. But what does your brother say? I mean, oh, obviously he's oh. getting a lot out of it or he wouldn't keep doing it. Oh, yeah. No, he, he, well, Zeb, he's always kind of had a bit of a spiritual uh -huh. kind of bent to him. And for five years he went out and was kind of practicing Buddhism, you know, kind of off in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, but he loves the experience. By the end, he just says it's like, you know, rain is falling over every pore of your body it's like magical and i'd love to do it i just i gotta carve out 10 days to, yeah you know, to try and do it yeah but but i'm tempted to i've never done it i've never done anything like that yeah so yeah um we'll do it together <laughs> or you could be competitive about it <laughs> no. well if rip's still sitting there like i can't leave <laughs> yeah um all right so i'll all right i'll just i'll, I'll i need to start I need uh -huh. to start being mindful. Yeah, and, and, and the other part of your question is like, how do you start? And I think yeah. it's never been easier. Um, in the same way that the the whole plant based thing has blown up, like the mindfulness meditation space has exploded as well. So um, there's all these apps now, whether it's Headspace or Calm. Uh, yeah. Sam, Sam Harris is waking up is great. He has all this you know really robust instruction that's very easy to understand. And he kind of takes you through, you know, the practical implications of what you're doing and you can set timers and, you know, set aside the time. And it's just like anything else. You make it a priority. You know, it's not like it's that thing where you say, I never have time, but you know, as well as anyone else yeah. for things that are important, you make the time. Yeah. So it's a question of whether you you're willing to make that decision to prioritize yeah. it. So on a day to day basis right now with everything you got going on, you know, eating the way you eat, being mindful, trying to get out for a run or a swim or a bike, your family, uh, you know, doing your, all, all your work. Are, are, you, are you planning your days out? Are you flying by the seat of your pants? Or is there like some in, in, in intention behind like mm. each day and each week? Um, a lot of it is flying by the seat of my pants. Um, especially since our, you know, our, like our family is now split between these two homes because yeah. of my teenage daughter schooling and, and every day it's like, all right, what do I have today? And where's Julie and who needs to be driven where, you know, a lot of it is like transportation logistics of moving kids around and things like that. And a lot of that dictates like how I set the schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do have to be regimented. Like I know the, there are certain days where I'm at, where I'm here and that's when I schedule my podcast and the meet, you know, like but I try not to schedule anything before 12 because that's when I 
train and do right. these other things for self care. And that doesn't, I don't always succeed at that. And then there's trips and things that come up. So there is forecasting. Like I know these are the things that I want to be doing in the next year or several months. And I'm plotting out well into the future on that stuff. But a lot of times, you know, my palm is in front of my face and I'm just looking at what needs to get done today. Hmm. With the podcast, do you, do you get nervous at all before any, any of your interviews or is this just like, so like second nature to you? It's, you get excited or I do I do get nervous in an excited way um, and I think I mean look I've done like 500 of these things right now so it's like if you know if I don't know what I'm doing by now like I'm never gonna know and I you know but there's always ways to do it better and I, mm. and I go into every one of them with this earnest desire to make it as great as I can make it. Like yeah. I want it to be the definitive conversation with that human <laughs> being you know what I mean so I put that pressure on myself and you know, ninety nine percent of the time, I don't achieve that. But that's that's the, that's what I go into it for. Um, and uh, and whether it falls short or not, like I, you know, there's only so much control I have over yeah. these th these sorts of things. And I've learned techniques and ways to kind of make it the way that I wanted to make it. Um, but I, I take it I take it seriously. Like I do a ton of research. So what, what you like know. when you say you do a ton of research, like. Um, couple hours i mean it just depends upon it depends the interview on the guest. yeah i mean i do a lot of authors so i do my best to read you know their books and sometimes like i get halfway through or 70 yeah. percent through or i listen to the audio book but i really try to be as steeped in 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 their world as i can like i i just try to enter their world for a couple days so i could be listening to three different audio books at the same time because i know i have these people coming up so I just try to be, you know, kind of in it at mm -hmm. all times, and I'll open up like thirty tabs on a browser and just go deep. And so, are you doing? Are you doing well, audio books? Are you reading? Or because of all it of depends some, on the kind of book yeah. too. Um, but audio books, because you know, I go out and train too. So if I'm on my yeah, bike or yeah. I'm running, like I'm also preparing for a podcast by listening to what this person has to say. But I think there's also what I've also learned is that. Um, you can prep too much yeah. for somebody and then it's stale because you know the answer to every question. So there's a certain um, spontaneity that, that you want and that only comes with, you know, the curiosity. It's, it's hard to be curious when you, know every, when you know everything about the person, right? Mm. And so I think it's more engaging for the listener if you're well-versed mm -hmm. but not an expert. Well, you know, so when I was uh, starting this, I was like, hey, I want to get in touch with you and you know, ask you a bunch of questions about doing a podcast. Uh -huh. I never, I never actually followed up on that. Right. Which is really stupid of me. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, I've had to learn and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm learning every day, right? I'm learning right now. I mean, I was like, I was nervous coming into this, this, because you're like, this is your space, right? This is just, yeah, but I know I'm just letting you know, this is your thing. And, uh, I'm like, all right, do I want to talk about, uh, you know, finding ultra, do I want to talk about where, I was trying to figure out where I wanted to take it. Uh -huh. And what I've realized is, you know, the best thing is just you and me talking, right? right? It's like every, all, all this, this stuff where I wanted to go, like in the beginning of this interview right, right. now, I'm like, oh man. You have to allow it to go where it wants to go. Yeah. Like there's a letting go, yeah. you know, and that, that comes with just showing up and being present. And if, if, if I say something that triggers something that yeah. makes you curious, then that's the thread that you pull. Yeah, it, it, you know it, it, exactly. And you're in that interview where they have their list of ten questions or whatever, <laughs> and they ask you the question, and you yeah. you blah blah blah, and you answer it, and they go, "Awesome, <laughs> right?" Ask you the next one, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's so dry and uninteresting because that person is not present mm -mm. for what is mm -mm. actually happening. And, well, and that and that to me is the most important thing mm -hmm. in doing right an interview and doing mm -hmm. a podcast and you have to have that you have to let go and you have to have faith that that you're going to be present yeah and and so much and, and there's a real art in listening right yeah and not just well think about this have you ever been at a dinner party and been in a conversation with someone and and like couldn't think of what to ask the person like if you're listening and you're engaged in a conversation like you're not thinking like what's my next question Right. No, you're, you're just not. you're just yeah. responding to what's happening. Yeah. Right. Totally. When we were 
talking and, and when you interviewed me the first time, uh, I talked a little bit about my relationship with my father mm -hmm. and um, how he was not a fan of me continuing to be a triathlete after a, a certain number of years. He thought I was kind of on a, um, on a fool's mission and it was this phantom mistress and it was not healthy and that I was avoiding getting married, getting a real job and all this other stuff. And my father and I have a, a much healthier relationship now. Mm -hmm. But when I was reading Finding Ultra, you know, the relationship with your dad and some of the resentment I think that you had uh, with your dad. And I just, I just want to know, um, and now that I have a son, right? right. I mean, where are, where are you with your relationship with, with your dad? My relationship with my dad now is really good. It's, it's really good. Um, it's not as enmeshed as yours because you guys like work together. We work together. Like, you work together. Um, but we went through a lot. And, you know, I, I put him through a lot. Um, <laughs> and then he put me through a lot. You know, like we've had, we've, we've, you know, we've been at each other for a long time. But we finally arrived in this place of, 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 of love and mutual respect that feels really good. Um, part of that is, um, you know, a lot of growth that I've undergone, but also growth that he's undergone as well. Um, and what's great is now, like now he writes books, he writes these historical biographies. So he just wrote this book about Marshall that came out and it's like being well received and he's doing, like he's doing an event in New York with General Petraeus. Like wow. it's crazy, you know, so I'm going to go for that. And he, my parents came out for the live event. And that was like, for them, like they're trying to wrap their heads around what I do and they don't quite get it. But they, re like I had my dad on the podcast and so he was able to um, experience oh, like, the I gotta response listen to, to that. that. Yeah, and we talked about our, we went, you know, pretty deep into our relationship on that, which was pretty cool. Um, so there's been a ton of healing there and you know, I think he finally kind of understands like what I do and what I'm about mm. and, 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 and he's proud, which feels good to me because yeah. he was like for a long time, he's like, what are you doing? You know? Um, and I get to be proud of, of him in this like third act with him being this author, which is great. And, and, you know, to have him on the podcast and try to support what he's doing is a pretty cool way of, of trying to pay it forward for him too. Hmm. Is he still driving a MG Midget? He finally sold that thing, but only recently he kept it up in Michigan for a long time. Yeah. I mean, that was, I remember when he bought that thing, I was like 13 or something like that. Yeah. I had an old girl, girlfriend that had an MG Midget and uh, I drove that thing around all the time. Yeah. So when I saw that, you know, when you wrote the book that he was driving or had one and still had uh -huh. it, I was like, oh, I got to find out if he still has that thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every yeah. once in a while, I'll see an MG on the road, and I'll, I'll be like, "Dad, I saw an MG," and he's like, "An yeah. MGB or a midget?" You yeah. know, it's like it's a there's a difference. Like, not many midgets around. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, like Rich a go kart engine in it. <laughs> um, so I didn't say this in the very beginning, so I'll I'll do it now. But the whole um, concept of season two of the Plant Strong podcast is the heart of a hero, and it's to have people on uh, on the podcast that are really changing the game mm. and changing the game and, and kind of showing people um, how how to do what they thought couldn't be done and uh, and just bringing people on board with this movement and you I think better than just about anybody epitomize that with what you've done with your incredibly you know rich powerful podcast and uh uh i just want to say thank you for you know mm. sharing a couple hours of your time with me and uh i look forward to the next time that we uh get to see each other at, whether it's an event who knows where um but uh, you are a truly plant strong brother and it's been it's been great. I appreciate that. That means more to me than than you can possibly imagine, Rip. Um, it really does. So thank you for for letting me share a little bit today. And you know, on that on that subject of like kind of the hero's arc or the hero's journey, we're all you know we're all the 
we're all the heroes of our own lives, right? We're all the movie stars in the movie of mm. our own lives. And, you know, I think that people look at change and they're scared of it or they're intimidated by it or they or they see that somebody else has done done it, but they don't see that own the the ability that they have within themselves. And, you know, if my story or the work that I do on the podcast and the other things stands for anything. It's that change isn't just possible. Like it's what we're here to do. We're here to grow and we're here to evolve. And we're all sitting on top of these reservoirs of, of potential. And so if you feel stuck, I assure you that you yeah. have the capacity to improve your lives, not just with your relationship with food, your diet, your nutrition, but in every facet and area of your life. And that is something that comes across in every guest that I've had on the show. When you ask me, like, what have you learned from all of these people? Yeah. All of these people have demonstrated that in different ways in their own lives. And so what I mine from that is, is that that ability, that capacity resides within all of us. Yeah. You are one articulate, <laughs> amazing human being, man. Hey, with that peace, engine two, Keep it planned strong. Nice. And you say peace plans. Peace plans. Yeah. yeah. Right on, man. Thank you, Rip. Thank you. Appreciate it. On behalf of Rich and myself, thank you for listening and inviting us into your cars, your kitchens, your minds, and your hearts. We could not do what we do without the support of people like you who are as passionate as we are about making this world happier, healthier, and more fulfilling. You've helped us, so how can we help you? Remember, you are the hero of your own journey, but we're here to support. Reach out at plantstrongpodcast.com to visit all of our resources, including our meal planner, Rescue 10X online course, and of course, Plan Stock 2020 that takes place next week. Peace. Engine 2. Keep it plan strong. The Plan Strong podcast team includes Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, Wade Clark, and Carrie Barrett. I want to thank my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Kryle Esselstyn for creating a legacy that will be carried on for generations and being willing to go against the current and trudge upstream to the causation. We are all better for it.